Hey friends, the Exiles in Babylon conference is happening again, April 18th through the 20th uh, in 2024 in Boise, Idaho. We're talking about deconstruction of the gospel, women power and abuse in the church, LGBTQ inclusion in the church, and three Christian views on politics and the gospel. Uh, We've got a loaded lineup of speakers, including Joshua Harris, Abigail Favalli, I mean Hudson, Edna Wickham, Julie Slattery, Tiffany Bloom, Sandy Richter, Lori Cree, Greg Coles, Art Perea, Brenna Blaine, Kat LaPrieri, Chris Butler, Carol Swain, Brian Zahn, plus a live podcast with hip hop all star KB and I mean Hudson of the Southside Rabbi Podcast. Street hymns will be performing throughout the conference. Worship by Evan Wickham and Tanika Wyatt, and also Max Lucado is going to be there. Uh, All the information is at theologyintheraw.com. Again, if you want to attend live in person, uh, I would register sooner than later. We're also going to live stream the conference. That option is there as well. Again, Exiles in Babylon, 2024, April 18th through the 20th. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest is the one and only Dr. N.T. Wright, who uh, has held posts at uh, Oxford University, Cambridge University, McGill University. He is um, was the former uh, Bishop of Durham between 2003 to 2010, is currently Research Professor Emeritus of New Testament at St. Andrews University and Senior Research Fellow at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. The author of all, over 80 books, including his most recent book, I'll hold it up here for those of you watching this, uh, Into the Heart of Romans, a deep dive into Paul's greatest letter, which focuses largely on uh, Romans chapter 8. It is an absolutely uh, fantastic book. I had the privilege of endorsing it, and I'm excited for you to get a bird's eye view of uh, both the book of Romans and especially Romans chapter 8. So please welcome back to the show, the one and only Dr. N.T. Wright. All right. Hey, Tom, welcome back to Theology in the Raw. I feel like it was just a few uh, months ago. I think it was less than a year since you were on last, but uh, excited to have you back on. (laughs) It's good to see you again. Thank you. Yeah. So you have a new book out. Uh, What? First of all, what number book is this for you? Do you you keep Uh, track anymore? I I, I keep a rough track, but it depends whether you count second editions and whether you count uh, collaborations and so on. I think in terms of books by me solo, solo, it's somewhere between eighty-five and ninety. Um, okay. I, I'm not actually sure, um, but it's that that's yeah. up around there somewhere. Well, and, and that number is a little um, arbitrary because some some authors who have books in that in those numbers, you know, they're they're writing, you know, uh, Christian living books that they spin out in a month. I mean, that, the number of books you've written includes books like Jesus and the Victory of God you know, a 600 plus page book with, you know, more footnotes than, <laughs> but by the way, I think I told you this last time that, that, that's, that's my favorite. Um, that's still my favorite, uh, Jesus and the victory of God. I really? just, oh, I will really? never read the gospels the same. Um, interesting. Do you yeah. know, I've, I've, I've had quite a few people say that to me. Indeed. I find it very moving. There's one or two people who've said the reason they are in new Testament as a professional mm-hmm. field is because they read Jesus and the Victory of God. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that's quite a responsibility. Um, <laughs> but for me, obviously, that book was published in '96, yeah, and it really was the fruit of about 20 years of reading books, historical Jesus books, all the way back to Ben Meyer and Skillebakes mm. and people like that. Over against all the stuff that I'd read when I was a student, whether it was Bultman or others. Oh, um, and realizing that the more you understand the Jewish context, mm-hmm. the more Jesus comes up in three dimensions. Mm-hmm. And then let's go and see where we where we end up. And I ended up in several places which I had not expected to end up, but it was very exciting. <laughs> and it still is yeah. very exciting right now. Yeah. Well, the book that put me into scholarship was what St. Paul really said. That, that oh, was really? the first book oh, I read oh, by oh, you. Oh, I had hardly oh, even, oh. I, I had known of the name N.T. Wright just from a distance. I'm like, oh yeah, some some British scholar or whatever. And somebody was actually Tim Gombis, who I think, you know, said, oh, um, I, w- I was, I was a second year seminary student. He's like, you should go read this book and okay. went and read it. And, and, uh, I, I, it, it turned my desire to go into scholarship from this is kind of a drudgery path. I feel like God is calling me to, to this is the most exciting career I could possibly <laughs> think of. So 
Yeah, that, that one did it for Amen. me. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm yeah. delighted to hear it. <laughs> Speaking of what St. Paul really said, we are uh, talking about Paul in this episode. So, so the, your, your most recent book is Into the Heart of Romans, a deep dive into Paul's greatest letter. That's a bold statement. Uh, Romans 8. Yeah. You would yeah. say is Paul's... Um, well, Paul's great. Okay, so so, okay, so I, I actually misinterpreted. Was I, I? I was thinking you're going to say Romans eight is the greatest chapter in Paul. Well, but you, you might you might say that you might say okay. that, and I, I know some people have said, and I think one or two of the people who've been kind enough, like you, to write blurbs for the book, have said, well, the general consensus is that Romans is Paul's greatest letter, and if you have to choose, Romans eight is the greatest chapter in that letter. Now, I wouldn't like to play off different yeah. chapters against each other, but there is something climactic about it. I mean, as as I've said often enough, and I think I say in the book, Romans is. Uh, you know, I, I I was trained as a musician and not a not to a high degree, but music is really important to me. And Romans is like a symphony. There are four movements in it, and like a symphony, a classical symphony, a Beethoven or a Tchaikovsky or whatever, the the four movements are significantly different, but mm. they go with one another and they lead into one another. And there are themes which recur in a different mode or whatever. And so Romans 8 is at the end of the second of those four movements. So it's right in the center. And in a way, it's the heart of Romans. And uh, when you think about the great themes that occupy Paul, whether it's uh, Jesus, whether it's sin and salvation, whether it's who is God anyway, whether it's suffering and hope, uh, resurrection, new creation, um, and much more besides, they're all in Romans 8, you know, Mm -hmm. Most of the letters, there's a, you know, like you can say First Corinthians, there's this chapter on love, and First Corinthians, there's mm-hmm. a chapter on um, factionalism in the church, and Philippians, there's um, a chapter of Paul telling his own story, and, and so on. But, but, but Romans 8 is a place where actually you've mm-hmm. got the Trinity, you've got salvation, you've got death and resurrection. Um, mm-hmm. What more do you want? Um, yeah. But also lots of surprises, and this is part of the point of the book, that um, uh, the older I've got, and not least through teaching some bright graduate students over the years, um, I've realized that the way we read Romans um, from early days and the way that most people still read Romans is very significantly flawed in terms of what Paul is actually saying. And mm. part of the point of this book is to go to the heart and say, now, if this is what's going on here, and the fun of doing this book was it isn't just a commentary on Romans, but because it's a commentary on one chapter, I'm able to take it line by line and and word by word, then all sorts of things open up which make you read Romans as a whole, Mm. Paul as a whole, maybe the gospel as a whole, Mm. um, interestingly differently, shall we say. Yeah. Can can we step back and... and, um... Sure. Let's pretend you're you're, you're talking to um, who's our audience. Let, let's just let's just say it's a first year, maybe seminary or university student. You know, they've been a Christian for a, a number of years. They've read Romans several times. They they maybe have read a book or two on on Paul. Um, but uh, you know, they they might be stuck with maybe some old. I know this is no knock on Lutheranism, yeah. but some old Lutheran categories. You sure. know, the, sure. the the Romans Road. You know, leading people to individual yeah. salvation. Can yeah. can you step back and and, yeah. and just give yeah. us an overview? How does Romans work? And then I ultimately want to see you just do a deep dive into how Romans eighteen yeah. functions yeah. within that larger overview. Right, yeah. right. Well, um, it's always tricky if I was lecturing to, as you say, a bunch of second year students who'd come from that kind of background, and I often do talk to people from very similar backgrounds. Indeed, our new students at Wycliffe Hall this year, in, here in Oxford, where I'm part-time teaching, may well be a lot of them from that background. But I'm always a, a, a little cautious because uh, I never want to come into a class and say, everything you've ever thought is wrong, let right. me give you something totally different. Because in all sorts of ways, I'd much rather people believe the old-fashioned Romans road than that they were out on the street being atheists or, <laughs> or you know, whatever. Um, in other words, Anything that makes people say um, there are big problems out there and I'm part of it and maybe Jesus is the answer, well, great. That's a good place to start. Now let's actually work at that and see. So it's a a yes, but rather than a forget it and here's something else. Um, At the same time, most people who read Romans in a traditional way assume that the big question which Paul is asking is how do we sinful humans get to go to heaven when we die? Mm -hmm. It's 
assume that that's what it's about. And people assume that the word salvation means going to heaven when you die. It's assumed that people, um, that the, the, the word glorification um, or glory itself is all about going to heaven when you die. And this is where I kind of rip the mask off and say, sorry, guys, that's <laughs> not what the story is all about. Actually, it's not what the Bible story is all about. And Romans, but the whole of the Bible is not about how saved souls go up and live with God. It's about how God comes to dwell with humans. The, the strap line in Revelation 21 is not the dwelling of humans is with God. It's the dwelling of God is with humans. Mm. That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's followed the entire biblical narrative through, because Old and New Testaments are absolutely welded together. And, the, and this is where uh, for me, one of the great surprises in my recent reading of Romans has been the way in which some of those Old Testament themes about God coming and living with his people in the tabernacle in the wilderness, then in the temple, they come back with a bang. But just to say it out loud, the word heaven hardly occurs in mm. Romans at all. And when it does, it is not talking about the place where God's people go when they die. So what is the story about? It's about new creation. And the new creation is God's original design from where his first creation was supposed to be going to eventually, um, which was thwarted because of human sin. So God has to deal with human sin in order to enable the project of new creation. And then the end of Romans, rather than being, well, now here's a few instructions for how to live, is that Paul believes that the church is called to be the small working model of new creation. Hmm. And we'll get back to that. But so once you start to look at the letter like that, it kind of shakes you up a bit because the first four chapters are not about you're all sinners, but Jesus died, therefore you're going to heaven. Hmm. It's God's world, God's beautiful creation is spoiled mm -hmm. because the humans who should have been looking after it on God's behalf have messed up. And when humans mess up, it's not just that the humans themselves are losing out, it's that God's project for creation is not going to its desired and intended goal. Mm -hmm. Now, if you say that to a first century Jew, many wise first century Jews will say, that's precisely why God called us. Abraham and his family are God's answer to the problem of the human race. So God called Abraham, he gave him a family, he gave him a land, and the land was the kind of sign that in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And the problem then intensifies because Paul says, I'm sorry, your own scriptures, the what Christians call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, make it clear all the way through. Uh, as soon as Abraham is called, he starts to mess up and go off to Egypt when he shouldn't have done. And uh, he, Abraham is a man of great faith and great failings, and those two march side by side. And the whole story of the Old Testament is about how the people who are called to be the solution to the world are also the mm. bearers of the problem. And the great prophetic narratives and first kings and goodness knows what, it's all about how that intention of God to rescue the world through the family of Abraham seems itself to fail. But here's the clue which takes you all the way through Romans, that when humans fail, when the, 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 court, the people who God has, God has called to be his partners in his work, when they fail, God doesn't give up on the plan. When humans sin, God doesn't say, okay, we're not going to do this human project anymore. Um, you know, he could have done. Noah uh, was the exception. He could have just said, I'm just going to blot, blot out the whole world. Likewise, and this is the problem. So many Christians, when they think about the Old Testament, they think, well, God had a first shot at saving people. He thought that if he gave them a law, maybe they would become better um, but sadly, it didn't work. So he gave up that purpose and sent Jesus instead. And Paul says no to that mm. way of mistelling the narrative. Mm. Jesus comes as the fulfillment of, and the, if you like, the, the corrective fulfillment of the whole Abraham and Israel project. He mm. is the Messiah, the faithful Israelite, who at last is able to carry that project forwards. So that the rescue of humans from sin is done through the fulfillment 
of the covenant mm -hmm. with Abraham. That is basically Romans 1 to 4, but it leaves all sorts of questions, and those questions are then addressed in 5 to 8, 9 to 11, 12 to 16. Those are the four mm -hmm. movements of the symphony we call Romans. Yeah. And particularly with 5 to 8, which is a wonderful piece of writing in itself. As I say, that movement of the symphony, you can play it just on its own. You need the rest fully to understand it, but it, you, you, you could do it like that. But this is about the human story and the human story with the Israel story woven into it. But the point of being human was never that the present world is a training ground or an exam room to see who's fit to go to heaven. The point of the human story is that God wanted his humans to be his image bearers, to reflect his stewardship and love into his creation. So that then one of the key verses in Romans 5 is 5.17, where he says that those who receive the gift of covenant membership of righteousness will reign in life. That's something which we don't think enough about. And people sometimes hear it as just another synonym for going to heaven. But mm -hmm. actually, when we get to Romans 8, we see what it's all about. Oh, yeah. But in Psalm 8, which is one of the back texts there, it says, what are humans? You've made them little lower than the angels to crown them with glory and honor, putting all things in subjection under their feet. So God rescues humans so that his, his redeemed humans will be the people through whom he puts his world right. And then the, we'll come back to the dark heart of Romans because the present stage of this rescue operation is very dark because the world is still in a mess. So what are we saved humans doing about it right now? We are lamenting, we are groaning, and the spirit is groaning within us. This is God using his people as the place where he can groan at the heart of his creation. Mm -hmm. That's a very profound thing. We'll come back mm -hmm. to it, as I say. Then it inevitably it raises the question, what are we then saying about Israel? Has God been faithful or not to his promises? 9 to 11 expounds, particularly the Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy, um, Romans 9 and 10, walk you through Genesis to Deuteronomy, particularly Deuteronomy uh, 30 at the end there, very powerful, 30 and 32. And then with chapter 11 saying, so what is God about to do? And Paul is very open-ended at that point. And he's saying to the Gentile Christians in Rome, don't write the Jews off because God hasn't finished with them, so nor should you. But he's not saying exactly what's going to happen, except that God will finally save all Israel, which then leaves all sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. But then 12 to 16, I've got really excited about 12 to 16 recently. <laughs> I might, who knows, maybe one day I'll write another book on that. Um, but as I say, the whole point about being Christian is not uh, we better try to keep our noses clean so that we will eventually make it to heaven or whatever. No, the church is to be the small working model of new creation, that the world had mm. never seen people living in this way. In particular, the world had never imagined people of different ethnicities and men and women and slaves and free, all sorts, worshipping together, praying together, loving one another as family. And that in the climax of the letter, Romans 15 verses 7 to 13, that is the sign to the world of the new creation, which is why Paul says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Spirit you may abound in hope. This is the idea that in the Old Testament, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How can the world possibly believe that? Answer, when there is a community living like this in their midst, that is a sign in the present time of what God intends to do for the whole creation. And I think that's how Romans hangs together. It's mm. about learning how to be the people of the Messiah, worshipping from all possible backgrounds, and so being the sign to the world that Jesus is Lord mm. and that God is going to renew all creation, and it will be glorious. So there, there, there's Romans in a nutshell <laughs> with Romans 8 at its heart. Did, did I do all right? How long? Yeah, I <laughs> You've been giving Romans in a nutshell talks, I think, since the late seventies, and I love, I, I love that you are are just as excited about it as ever. I oh, mean, I mean th that alone is is it's uh, amazing. It, it, I mean, it's an amazing letter, and every 
every year or two, I see something else and I think, oh my uh, goodness, I wish somebody had told me that 50 years ago. You know, I have so <laughs> many questions. Um, I, yep. um, okay. Wh- okay. Which one do I, let me, let me start with this one. Uh, it, um, you, you didn't quite mention, we didn't say the words like the new perspective on Paul or really draw. I mean, uh, you touched on it, the, 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 the significance of the Jew Gentile issue that previous readings of Romans maybe didn't uh, appreciate. Now, f- let, me, let me just give a 30 second kind of, you know, for somebody that doesn't have any clue what we're talking about, you know, uh, but prior to like the late seventies, you know, the, the the, the Jew Gentile kind of issue is kind of just lingering there in the background in, in the early parts of Romans or all of Romans, really. It's just kind of there, but it did. I, I think people didn't really understand this, the theological significance of what Paul's dealing with there. Um, but in the late seventies and then on through the eighties and nineties, there was, you know, kind of a, I don't know how to describe it. It's, you know, debated whether we should even use this term, but you know, the new, the new perspective on Paul was kind of uh, showing a much greater appreciation or awareness of the Jew Gentile yeah, issue yeah, yeah. to the point to where people almost, you know, we're, we're really rethinking, you know, the whole idea of justification by faith. We might've gotten this all wrong and, and you've written plenty on this. C- can you give your own um, summary of maybe that um, uh, sure, sure. different I mean, emphasis in Romans? Yeah. 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 It's a very interesting thing that so much New Testament scholarship was dominated for generations by people within the Lutheran tradition. Now, there are many great things about the Lutheran tradition. Mm -hmm. It's easy to knock it for certain reasons, but it's a noble tradition. You know, um, Mm -hmm. use the cliche, some of my best friends are Lutherans. Well, maybe not quite, but sort of. But (laughs) had it been the Reformed traditions that had been leading the way, there would have been no need for the new perspective. Because if you look at a great reformed scholar like, say, Ridder- Herman Ridderboss from the previous mm, generation, yeah. an awful lot of new perspective stuff actually is bubbling along in his work as well. Because the difference there is basically, to, to, to put it in its crudest terms, that within the, the great wave of Lutheranism and much modern British and American evangelicalism has that mm. as its root, then you say, well, um, we can't get to heaven by doing our own good works. Fortunately, God has said that the law, all that is irrelevant and that the Jews were barking up the wrong tree and he's done something totally different and all you have to do now is believe. And so what then do we say about Torah? And We say it's abolished. What do we say about Israel? We say, well, it's irrelevant or possibly even abolished. And we know, of course, part of the reason for the new perspective is that after the Second World War, people all over the place (laughs) said, hang on, what are we saying if we're saying that the Jews should have been abolished? That's basically what Adolf Hitler was saying. Mm. And whatever is the right answer, we know that that's the wrong answer. But Mm. the reformed people, I mean, and Karl Barth was saying this from way back when, um, Barth in his Church Dogmatics makes it quite clear that Luther was reading his own situation back into Paul and imagining um, that, that Paul's opponents, the so-called Judaizers, that's misleading as well, were really like medieval Roman Catholics who Luther was opposing because they were all about doing good things in order to please God. So um, Luther imagined that the Jews were all about doing good things to please God. Now, I was fortunate in that almost by providential accident, if you like, um, before I'd really started studying Paul in postgraduate mode, somebody mm. put me onto a commentary on Genesis by the Jewish scholar Umberto Casuto. Oh, it's yeah. a big old commentary on Genesis. It's over on those shelves over there. And Casuto points out, as you work through Genesis, that the promises to Abraham echo the commands to Adam. And Casuto is very clear, and this comes through in the rabbis again and again and again, that the way that Genesis is written has God calling Abraham to reverse and undo the sin of Adam. That God says to Adam, um, be fruitful and multiply and look after the garden. God says to Abraham, I will make you fruitful and I'll give you this land. So the land is the new Eden and so on. And from when from when I first saw that, it's one of the things you can't then unsee because it helps you to read the whole of the Bible, Mm -hmm. actually. But then particularly when you get to Romans, and I was already grubbing around in Romans before I even started my, my doctoral work on it. 
it used to be thought that Romans 4, where Abraham comes in, was just an example of somebody in the Old Testament who was justified by faith. Here we are, Genesis 15, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, okay, we know the Old Testament is all about justification by works, but there are one or two people back there who are justified by faith. And that's complete rubbish. Genesis 15 is the covenant chapter where God makes the covenant with Abraham. And the covenant, as Paul says, has in mind the whole world. God's promise to Abraham was that he should inherit the world. And suddenly you see so many things differently. So I was messing around with that stuff before the new perspective was launched by Ed Sanders and then Jimmy Dunn, who was my um, uh, doctoral examiner, started writing about it in the early 1980s. And so that, that was all going on. But it was a way of saying, when we read Paul, let's not imagine that he's got it in for the Jews and he's just being a kind of a self-hating ex-Jew who says, no, no, that was all wrong. Now, there's a problem here because there are some, I'm thinking of, to name names, a scholar like Paula Fredrickson, who's a very fine scholar in all sorts of ways, but she, from the beginning was following Christus Stendhal, who is the great Harvard teacher and, and himself a Swedish Lutheran bishop, who pioneered a version of the new perspective, yeah. which was a kind of a two-track salvation, that actually God wants Jews just to go on being good Jews, and Christianity is a wonderful way for Gentiles to come in on something similar. And that now has turned itself into a whole movement calling itself the radical new perspective. And I have to say, to be honest and blunt, I think it's complete rubbish. It just <laughs> doesn't work with the text. Galatians 2, I through Torah died to Torah that I might live to God. You know, that's very dramatic. And in 1 Corinthians 9, to the Jews I became as a Jew to win yeah. the Jews. You know, and, and other texts as well. So, but the whole point of the new perspective is let's not imagine that Israel was a first shot on God's part at saving people, which didn't work, so he gave it up. Rather, we have to be into some sort of fulfillment, transformation, enlargement, whatever. And this mm -hmm. isn't anti Jewish, it's actually deeply pro Jewish in the sense that it's affirming. Um, God's call to Abraham as a good thing. It's affirming Torah as a good thing. It's affirming the tabernacle and the temple as good things. But in the Old Testament themselves, as the New Testament writers are aware, they're all pointing forwards with a big question mark. What's it going to look like when all this stuff comes together? And Paul says, it looks like Jesus, who is mm. Israel's Messiah according yeah. to the flesh, which yeah. gets you as far as... Um, Romans one three and Romans nine five, but um, yeah. yeah. Anyway. What one of the Sorry. verses that first I'm alerted answer. me? No, no, yeah. One of the verses that first alerted me to kind of just a, again a different shade of reading was uh, Romans uh, three twenty eight and the question that follows in three twenty nine. So in three twenty eight, famous verse, Paul says, "For we we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law." And for so many years, we've all assumed that works of the law was simply works righteousness, almost detached yeah, right. from its. Jewishness. Well, if that's true, then why would Paul raise a question in 29? Or is God yeah. the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles? It's like, that's an yeah. odd question yeah. to raise exactly. about your statement if works of the law was some abstract, you know, works righteousness. It, it, exactly. Here there's a, there's an intrinsic Jewishness that he's kind of responding to here. Yeah. And then that, that really leads into the whole of chapter four, where he's saying Abraham was, you know, not just the you know, father of it's Jews, but Gentiles very, also. Very interesting. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, I had to go and do some lectures on Paul in uh, somewhere in Alabama, I think, um, mm -hmm. or Louisiana, somewhere down there. And the other main speaker was Richard Gaffin from uh, oh, yeah. Westminster Seminary. Uh -huh. And I took that verse as my intro because I, I, I said my model throughout my academic life has been William Tyndale, who said that um, I call God to witness that I did not alter one syllable of God's word against his, 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 its meaning or whatever. And the little word at the beginning of verse 29, which you, when you read it there, you, it translates as or, it's the Greek word e, which is simply yeah. the letter eta. It's a single letter word. Now, if you look at English translations, sadly, including Tyndale's own translation, it's missed out. And they, it's, it's as though there's a break. And, uh, you know, you have, we're justified by faith, not works of the law. And then, is God the God of Jews only? But the little word or means that if justification were by works of Torah, mm -hmm. 
then God mm. would be primarily the God of the Jews. And so suddenly the whole thing turns. And so for me, you know, part of the difficulty is a lot of people from conservative Christian backgrounds in America and Britain imagine that anyone who disagrees with the interpretation they were, they were taught is a liberal who is denying some part of the Bible. And of course, there are many people who would answer to that description who want to say, <laughs> oh, at this point, Paul just had hiccups or whatever. And I've gone the other route. I've said, no, we have to pay more attention to every last syllable of what's going on. And when we do that, we find that Paul himself will challenge our traditions of interpretation. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in in my conservative evangelical environment, I remember when I first heard your name. Yeah, it was like, oh, isn't that that liberal British scholar? I'm like, oh man, well, I don't, I don't know if I should read him. So I had to kind of, you know, go to the coffee shop, put in your sure. books in a brown paper bag, so no one would see me. And then uh, I was like, I don't know, he, he okay. seems to be really into this Bible thing. I don't know if <laughs> we should call him. A I, I, I mean, anecdotally, I once uh, several years ago lectured in Sydney, Australia. And Sydney is a place where it's very conservative evangelical yeah. Anglicanism. And uh, uh, after I'd lectured at Moore College one morning and just about escaped with my life, um, <laughs> a good friend who was who was in Sydney, he said, it's so funny because after you left, all the chat on social media was people saying, it's funny, N.T. Wright seems to know the Bible quite well. And, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, um, excuse me, read my lips. I've been soaking myself in this stuff day and night, quite literally, for the last 40 years. What do you expect? <laughs> all right, anyway. well, let, let's let's go to Romans 8. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy for you to, I want to hear two things, really. I'd love for you to kind of walk through it. Um, one of the uh, secondary questions I have is, I mean, you've, you've, you've been studying Romans for decades, written a commentary on it. I would, know, would love to know what kind of fresh, newer insights you have more recently come to with regard to this chapter. Right. So yeah, yeah, however you want to approach those two angles. Right. Um, one, one which has come very recently, and I, I'm ashamed of this because I should have seen it years ago, I mean, decades ago, is at the end of Romans 7, but leading into it, where Paul talks about Romans 7.23, that I see another law at war in my members taking me captive. Now, the word Paul uses for taking me captive, eikmelotidzonta. If you look up that root, eikmelotidzo or whatever, or eikmelotos, in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, again and again and again, that's a clear reference to exile. It's there in the Psalms, it's there in the Prophets. It regularly means exile. And when you realize that Romans 7, among many other things, is telling the story of Israel receiving Torah, but Torah saying, if you do this and this and this, the answer is exile. You realize that Paul is tracking with the story of Adam and the story of Israel, the Old Testament story of Israel. And that then Romans 8, 1 to 11 is saying, and here's God's answer to that problem. And now here's the thing, one of the two big things which I've been really excited about just in the last decade or so in reading the New Testament in general and not least Romans. The first is about the theme of the tabernacle and the temple, that in the tabernacle and the temple, God comes to dwell in the midst of his people, not just because he wants to hang out with them, but because the tabernacle and the temple are the signs of new creation. The tabernacle is a small microcosm of the new creation, so that the line from Genesis 3 to Exodus 40 is humans mess up, they get booted out of the garden, there are thorns and thistles, but God intends to make new creation, and he calls Israel to be the people in whose midst he comes to dwell in the in this tent, which is a little small model of new creation. Then when Solomon makes the temple, it too is designed and built as a sign of new creation. It's a forward-looking mm. symbol towards new creation. That is a hugely important insight. So when in Romans 8, 1 to 11, Paul talks about the Messiah being in you, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, we ought to say, hang on, this idea of somebody dwelling in something, that language again and again and again is Old Testament language for God coming into the tabernacle or the temple. And the point about that is that after the exile, the temple gets rebuilt. That's the great promise, the end of Ezekiel, for instance, and Isaiah about 
um, the watchmen lifting up their voices because in plain sight they see Yahweh returning to Zion and it's all going to be all right again. And then, of course, the New Testament translates that into the language about Jesus and the Spirit, that the coming of Jesus is emphatically the word became flesh and dwelt in our midst and we beheld his glory, John 1, uh, 14. That is temple language. That's Exodus 40 language. And Pentecost in Acts 2 is just like um, Exodus 40 or Isaiah 6 or 1 Kings 8. This is the rushing mighty wind coming into the house and indwelling now people. Mm. Jesus and the church are themselves the new temple. And what is the new temple? The sign and the means of new creation. So that you've got that in Romans 8, 1 to 11, and lots more going on there as well, of course. This is how God is putting the whole thing right. And then Romans 8, 12 to 30 is, okay, if that's who you now are, you have a vocation. This is mm. one of the key things that Romans 8, 12 to 30 isn't about salvation. That's kind of given. It's about vocation. What does it mean to be one of these God-bearing new temple humans? It means to share the sufferings of the Messiah, but you may also share his glory. And his glory is his sovereignty over the world through which the world is being put right. And then the end of the chapter 31 to 39 this can then be celebrated. What shall we say if God is for us, who is against us? And it's written, obviously, to a church facing great persecution. Paul, whether he knew it or not, uh, the people he was writing to were about to face the Neronian persecution, where the Christians were, you know, daubed with pitch and set alight to, to lighten Nero's garden parties and that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> so, so that key central passage verses 12 to 30, is about the vocation which comes from being new temple people within that long narrative. And uh, just if I can sum this up aphoristically, when I now lecture about justification, what I say is this, God is going to put the whole world right in the end. That's promised in the Old Testament mm -hmm. again and again. In the present time, through the gospel and the spirit, God puts human beings right, justification, so that they may be part of his putting right project mm. for the world, rather than so that they may escape the world and go and be with him in heaven. That is not the name of the game. It's about the vocation of humans to be genuine, image-bearing, glorified, putting the world right humans. Mm. And from there, of course, all sorts of vocations. I had an email the other day from a lady I don't know, somewhere in Britain, she didn't tell me where, and she's been going, she'd be reading some of my stuff, but she goes to a church where they teach that the only thing that matters is getting souls into heaven, mm -hmm. and that anything else, feeding the hungry or caring about justice in the world, um, that's irrelevant, leave that to the politicians. Right. Um, and so she is saying, how do, I, how do I explain to my church leaders that the Bible is actually about God putting the world right and putting us right to be part of that? So, Please, God, help her and help so many who are trying to do that. Like, like you, my friend. I mean, yeah. I know that you agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, e even the um, going back to how the, the Jew-Gentile issue is so significant for Paul's understanding of justification by faith. Um, I mean, that, 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 that gives us a pretty profound and I would say very clear and provocative paradigm for ethnic reconciliation in, in the church oh, yeah. today. That, that you oh. can't divorce this thing called the gospel from... Um, ethnic tensions and ethnic, you know, um, ethnic reconciliation that needs to be embodied first in the church before we um, can expect the world to kind of do it, you know. But, this is um, why the tragedy of the last two or three hundred years is so appalling. Mm. I was thinking the other day, think of apartheid in South Africa. Yeah. You know, when I was young, South Africa was completely divided, black and white. And that was being justified by Christians in one particular branch of the Reformed tradition mm -hmm. who had forgotten what some of the Reformed tradition was about all along. But you see, I track this back, sadly, to the Reformation, because at the Reformation, they were all insisting on having the Bible and uh, the liturgy in their own languages. And so you in London, by the end of the 16th century, you have a French church and a Portuguese church and a Polish church and a this and a that and the other. And then they all got exported to the new world. Guess what? And 
um, the different ethnic groups all made their own churches and developed theologically within their own ways. And then when you get on top of that, all the terrible horror of the slave trade, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which we know uh, all about how that went. Um, so you then get uh, churches variously in terms of skin pigment pigmentation, mm -hmm. black churches and white churches. And the idea that you and I are white, I mean, mm -hmm. that itself is ridiculous. You know, I'll show you what white is. That's white. <laughs> now, if, if I looked like that, you'd say, hey, Tom, you need to go see the doctor. Um, I, I'm not white. I'm variously pink and brown and so on. The only reason we called ourselves white was to differentiate ourselves from blacks, but to do so with a word which said, um, we are the real article. We like the white chess pieces instead of the black mm. chess pieces, you know. Um, we, we, are, we are the true lot and, and, and they are kind of a mutation or something. Um, and we, we taught ourselves in the 18th and 19th century these developmental theories. You know, social Darwinism was alive and well long before Charles Darwin. And he just gave it an extra pseudo-scientific validation to enable people to say, um, uh, you know, th they're actually different. We shouldn't be mixing with them. We certainly shouldn't be intermarrying. We shouldn't do this, that, mm -hmm. the other. Um, instead of which, the book of Revelation, and especially the letter to the Romans, says one people, one family, Jew, mm -hmm. Gentile, slave, free from every nation and kindred and tribe and tongue, worshipping together together. That is the sign to the world that Jesus is Lord. And, you know, I hope and pray that in our generation that message is coming through because it is central to the New mm -hmm. Testament. I have to preach on Ephesians uh, in mm -hmm. um, 10 days' time for a, a big service for my brother-in-law, bless him, is uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of his ordination, asked me to come and preach wow. for the special service. And uh, I'm going to take Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. There is one body and one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Yeah. And all ministries are given to further that unity. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's what we ought to be about. So I could yeah. expand this all again. <laughs> well, even even that's interesting that, that, that Ephesians 4, 1 to 6 flows right from Ephesians. Ephesians 3, which flows right out of Ephesians 2, which is all about ethnic right. reconciliation. It's all linked it's together nice. so that, that the, 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 the profound unity in Ephesians 4, Paul has yeah. not left behind Jew-Gentile. No, exactly. You know. And I'm hoping to make exactly that point in the sermon, that uh, Ephesians 1, verse 10, God's plan is to join all things in heaven and earth mm. together. What? If the reformers had taken Ephesians rather than Romans and Galatians as their set text, <laughs> the entire history of the Western world might have been different. <laughs> well, because with Romans and Galatians, totally they, were able to read, they were able to read Romans and Galatians in the light of the medieval question of how, do, how does my soul get to heaven? Whereas had they been reading Ephesians properly, they would have said, hang on, we're not supposed to be going to heaven. We're supposed to be the people in whom heaven and earth are joined. And then the joining of Jew and Greek Ephesians chapter 2, is the outworking of that. And then in chapter 3, um, the church is to be the sign to the principalities and powers of the polychrome wisdom of God. Hey, polypoikilos, mm -hmm. Sophia, to theu. Um, in order that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's back to that Isaiah line about the whole earth being full mm -hmm. of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The church is filled with that in the present to be the sign to the world. I, I just find that so mm. powerful. And I grieve that so many churches, supposedly Bible churches, simply ignore that. Mm. Well, I, I want to um, go back to a, and we'll, we'll get back to Romans in just one second. But yeah, yeah. I had uh, a friend of mine, actually, is Tim Gomez again. Tim, Tim oh, yeah. I got to yeah. make sure he listens to this episode. He's going to keep coming up. But, you know, he did his PhD on Ephesians. And, and he, he, he told me this is probably 20 years ago, maybe. And he's like, you know, I, I know we always think Romans captures kind of the heart of Paul and, 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 you know, it's a, it's an amazing letter, but Ephesians is the only letter of Paul or it's the one letter of Paul that has the least, um, contextual kind of like 
orientation. Yep. It is the if there is yep. if there is Paul sitting back in his chair, you know, reflecting on just theology apart from a local church context, it is Ephesians. It's designed to be a circular letter. There's some contextual stuff going on, but it is the most kind of just Paul sitting back and painting yep. this yep. grand picture. Yep. Whereas even Romans has some real contextual stuff that's cool. driving the letter. Sure. Um, if we're going to sure. take, I mean, it, 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 could there be a case to be made that that if we're going to have one letter that captures kind of Paul's grand sweep of salvation, of, of yeah. history, of the world, of it would be Ephesians? That, that, that's what F.F. F. Bruce said in his book on Paul a generation ago. He described huh. it as the quintessence of Paulinism, which I think was a phrase that he got from somebody back in the mm. 30s or somewhere. And actually, when I was being interviewed for, for my, my first real job, um, one of the questions was, uh, to what extent is Romans the real systematic theology? And I said yeah. rashly, I said, if anything, that's Ephesians. Oh, and I remember saying that in an interview in 1975, and the chap who was interviewing me said, um, there would be some gaps, wouldn't there? Um, <laughs> and I quickly thought, uh, yeah, okay, he says nothing about um, the Eucharist, for instance. He says quite right. a bit about baptism, but there's nothing about the Eucharist, and no doubt there's plenty of other things that aren't touched. In other words, it's not a systematics in the sense of covering all possible topics, but it is... I mean, it's liturgical. Ephesians 1 to 3 is one great shout yeah. of praise yeah. with teaching woven in. But but yes, it, and I, I think what you said before is exactly right. It's a circular. I think Paul is in prison in Ephesus and is writing this so that it can go around to all the different mm. churches. I suspect that it is the letter to Laodicea to which he refers in Colossians. Um, and okay. I so... So naturally, I think it is decontextualized to that extent, though it is contextualized in that the style, as Ben Witherington points out, is more what we now call Asiatic. It's it's the florid style of Western Turkey uh, in those days, Ephesians yeah. and Colossians both, which explains a lot over against Romans and Galatians. That, that's a whole other question. Yeah. But so, yes, I'm basically agreeing. Ephesians... Yeah actually pulls it together in quite a coherent, systematic way. Mm -hmm. And it's Ephesians that then says, okay, the two key things are unity and holiness. Mm -hmm. And if you're struggling after both unity and holiness, guess what? You'll land up in spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And that's basically Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, um, with, the, with the holiness, yeah. including not least the marital holiness of chapter 5. Well, I think I, I think our view of the atonement would, would in include a much greater appreciation for the, what we now call, you know, Christus Victor models, where it's it's conquering oh, yeah. the, oh, yeah. the powers of darkness, rather than just justification by faith. I think it would balance out sure. our view of the atonement a bit more. To be sure. And, and as I've argued in my book, The Day the Revolution Began, it isn't Christus Victor or substitutionary right. atonement. Right. It's, it's victory through substitution, and you need mm. both to go together, otherwise they don't work, or don't work no. the way they should. Yeah. Well, we left off in Romans 8, I believe, yep, yep. 17. <laughs> Can you, yep, yep. For, for the remaining uh, few minutes we have, yep, do you want yep. to pick it up in verse 18 and, and well, take yeah, us into I mean, a deep dive there? For, for, me, this, for me, this was an extraordinary uh, turning around because I had a student, uh, Haley Goranson Jacob, who's now teaching in Whitworth College up in the far northwest of the States, and she pointed out the way in which Psalm 8 has influenced what Paul is doing here, yeah. as well as the other Psalms, Psalm 44, not least, <clears throat> but that the, the vocation to be the people who are carrying forward God's purpose for the world means that when we look at creation, we are seeing creation as a whole longing for God's redeemed humans to be raised from the dead so that creation can then be put back properly the way it should be. It's not going back to Eden. It's going on towards the new creation that Eden was supposed to be the pilot project for. But at the heart of that, and, and you know, this still gives me goosebumps after all these years, the little bit about prayer in verses 26 and 27, if yeah. you look at the average commentary on Romans, that's treated as a separate paragraph, almost as an aside, as though in the middle of this rather difficult and complex passage, Paul just drops in this little bit about, by the way, the Spirit helps us because when we don't know what to pray for, the Spirit enables us to pray or something. But that, that misses the point entirely. Paul is building this up and building this up, that creation is groaning in travel, and the groaning is like the children of Israel groaning in Egypt 
waiting and God listens and hears and comes and acts. And so now the spirit is groaning. And where are we, the church? Are we sitting on the sidelines saying, um, sorry, creation is groaning. Are we sitting on the sidelines saying pity that creation can't get its act together? Because, of course, we're all right because we're going to heaven. So that's OK. No, not at all. The church is groaning at the heart of the groaning of creation. And I've often preached about this and said, you know, the world is in a mess at the moment on issues of sex and gender. The church is in a mess on issues of sex and gender. Mm -hmm. That may be sad, but it's not surprising because we are called to be the people who stand at the place where the world is in pain. And I know that you and mm -hmm. your work, you've done mm -hmm. more than most on that. But then where is God in the middle of this? Mm -hmm. And the answer is God by the Spirit comes to dwell at the place where the world is in pain by dwelling in the hearts of his faithful people so that when they are most aware of the pain and horror of the world and when there's nothing to say except, um, my God, why did you abandon me? Mm -hmm. Then at that very point, the spirit is groaning within us with uh, stenagmois alaletos, with groanings that cannot even come into speech. And mm -hmm. when you realize what Paul is saying, he's saying that there are some situations which are so bad that even the third person of the Trinity has no words to say wow. what's really going on. That, that, that is enormously powerful. That's why I see this as the uh, pneumatological equivalent of the cry of dereliction from the cross in, 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 in uh, uh, Matthew 27 and, and Mark 15, when Jesus cries out, my God, why did you abandon me? And the idea is that the church, this is part of the glory, the present glorification of the church, is that the church is privileged to be the people who lament and, and bear the lament of the Spirit mm -hmm. within their lament in order to be the people of lament at the places where the world is groaning in travel right now. And there's a lot of people out there, whether it's in Syria or Ukraine or uh, uh, the Yemen or wherever, and many, many places of our own world. You know, I always say to the students, when you look down from the pulpit, every face that you see is hiding some secret sorrow and lament with them and teach them how to lament. And so it's not just the, the really obvious places. It's, it's everywhere and all of us. But in the middle of that, that is our vocation. And so the idea that from verse 12, we are debtors to God. God has done all this for us. He's given us this promise of resurrection so that we can now be the people who are mm. formed according to the pattern of the Son. That's verse 29, uh, the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among a long, large family. Jesus came to the place where the world is in pain to take that pain upon himself. We in the spirit are called to be at the place where the world is in pain so that in our intercession and lament especially when we we run out of words because the situation mm -hmm. is so bad then and there god will be groaning and mm -hmm. knowing what's going on and so that trinitarian prayer mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. The th there are theologians today who say, well, the New Testament sort of points vaguely at the doctrine of the Trinity, but thank goodness by the time of the 4th and 5th century, they'd really got it together and, and, and then they'd sorted <laughs> it all out. So that's where we need to be. And I say, absolutely not. The doctrine of the Trinity is emphatically, dramatically in Romans 8 and John's Gospel and all over the place. Yeah. And all that the fathers do is they find some neat formulae and some slogans to put it into. But the real heart of the matter is right here. And, yeah. anyway, and don't on that <laughs> well these few paragraphs i mean the, the 26 through 28 29 it, it really does i mean and you've written on this well you, i don't know what you haven't written on but you've, <laughs> on the problem of evil you know i just had this conversation with somebody yeah, yeah. about you know the problem of evil and i'm not i'm not totally satisfied with all the solutions to that but the one at least the one thing that not one, but one of many things that the Christian worldview contributes is it has, it, it talks about a God that's participating in the suffering that we are bemoaning. Exactly. And, and, and this exactly. is, I don't know any other kind of religious or non-religious perspective or quote unquote attempted solution to the problem of evil that has something like this at the that's, end of Rome. That's exactly right. And uh, here's the thing. When I did the Gifford lectures in Aberdeen, which is, um, I guess, five years ago now, my goodness, I don't know if you know that book, <laughs> History and Eschatology, which is- Yeah, yeah, that was, I saw that. that. That was such an exciting book to write. But David Ferguson, who was then professor in Edinburgh and is now professor in Cambridge, made the point to me in one of the discussion groups when he said, 
you know, when they were looking at the problem of evil in the 17th and 18th and 19th century, they tended to come at it as deists. In mm. other words, there is evil, there is God up there, he's supposed to be in charge, so there's a problem, isn't there? And he said, it's because they were factoring Jesus out of the equation and, and, and the spirit wow. out of the equation, as though you could first solve the problem of God and the world, and then once you'd said, okay, so we can believe in God after all, then you can say, well, guess what? Now you need to find out about Jesus. And I would say emphatically, it can't be done. The New mm. Testament is very clear. You want to know about God, look at Jesus and yeah. invoke the Spirit. So I'm totally with you. And that leads, you see, to the revisionist interpretation of 828, because we all grew up, it was one of the verses we learned, uh, school children, if we were learning verses, uh, all things work together for good for those who love God or to those who love God. Um, and that's the wrong translation. Um, mm. It's because, particularly in the Reformed tradition, uh, Reformation traditions, people were frightened of the word synergy because it sounded like synergism. It sounded mm. as though we contribute to our salvation. But it isn't contributing to our salvation. It's contributing to our vocation. We know that to those who love God, which is a reference back to that spirit groaning within us in the inarticulate prayer, that's the loving God bit, is being caught up in the loving Trinitarian purposes. We know that through those who love God, God yeah. works all things together for good. So it isn't that we sit back like sort of Stoics and say, well, it'll all pan out. You know, yeah. God's at work somewhere. Um, you know, there's the, the, the um, pastoral theologian Kate Bowler in Duke Divinity School who um, has this thing about everything happens for a reason. And she says, don't give me that. That's completely wrong. You know, that's, that's not, not the Christian point of view, that all things uh, that God works all things through those who love him. In other words, the agency of Christian prayer, not least the spirit-led wordless lament of which Paul has, is speaking, is part of the means by which God is working his purpose out. That's what it means, Romans 5.17, to be ruling, to be royal, to be the royal priesthood at the present time, that's the vocation we have. So, so, so wait, real quick, the ones who, and we might need to get for, you know, I'm just looking at the Greek here. So the, so the, the, the date of plural, the ones who love God, it's, it's by, by means of the ones who love God. Yes. They are, because, they are agents yeah. in God working all things together for good. Yeah. They're, and that's the I, point. I, th there I, think, I, I think I spell this, I think I spell this out in the book, but yes, um, the, the, um, it, Paul uses the word synergio a couple of other times when he's talking about his fellow workers. And one mm -hmm. of the obvious ones at the beginning of second Corinthians six, where he says, therefore, working together with him, mm. we beseech you not to receive the grace of God in vain. And um, if you look at that and the, and the other passages, um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, it's clear that Paul sees the human vocation, the apostolic vocation as being to be working with God. And the verb takes, takes the dative. But it, mm. of course, it's like so often in Paul, it's scrunched together. That's yeah. why I say the Toi sacrosin ton theon, the ones who love God, is in the dative. It refers back to the people in whose hearts the Spirit is working. And uh, it, it's that's uh, God is, I think, God is the subject of the verb synergy. God works all things for good through. He work, you work through or with. The sun takes, uh, takes the toi sacrosin there, with, with those who love God. As I say, I, I spelt this out in the book. But, yeah, yeah. Um, and. <laughs> Um, if if so, if somebody wants to if somebody wants to chase it up, it's all there. Yeah, I, I kind of wish Paul would have said "dia" with a genitive, right? I mean, you know, Greek a thousand uh, well, times better. Well, <laughs> yeah, there, there, there may be there may be a reason maybe a reason for yeah. that as well. And just see if I've got. Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I do recall um, you discussing yeah, that in the book. Yeah. Let's see. I'm yes. looking at it too here. No, it's, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, where, where is it, say, top of page 159, where Paul uh, uses yeah. this verb elsewhere, it means two agencies collaborating with one another on a shared task. Um, and that um, the, the person or people with whom the subject is collaborating are regularly placed in the dative. So here, the Greek dative, tois agapostin tontheon, tells us 
who it is that God is co-working with. God mm. is collaborating with those who love him. So mm. God is the subject with those who love him, which is a reference back to the previous um, the previous uh, couple of verses, etc. And and so much yeah. more, so much more. And not least, one of the things, one of the last bits of the jigsaw that fell into place when I was doing the lectures on which this book was based was looking at 830, which of course has been a central text for a Calvinistic doctrine of predestination. Sure. But if you look if you look at the Old Testament, and it's very interesting that in my uh, cross, cross references in the Nestle Allen Greek New Testament, Isaiah 40 to 55 does not feature by those verses. But as I say in the book, in Isaiah 45, you've got in the Lord, all the offspring of Israel will triumph and glory. They will all um, be dikaios and have doxa. And Paul is huh. tracking very closely with the servant theme, where the servant is the one through whom God accomplishes his purpose. So to say it again, verses 12 to 30 is not about salvation, which is a given throughout mm -hmm. the larger picture. It is about vocation, mm -hmm. vocation to be the spirit indwelt messianic people for the sake of a world in pain. Wow. Well, Tom, we're just butting up against an hour here, and uh, I, I mean, you've given us about three hours worth of content. <laughs> Those who are prone to listen to a podcast at you know double speed will hopefully not do that with this one, and I'm sure many will go back and re-listen to this. Um, um, well, any any final words of I guess uh, somebody? I'm sure they'll be excited to go back and read Romans A. What, what a in in you know thirty seconds. What, what would you want a Christian to walk away with after reading Romans 8 in a nutshell? Well, I would want them to walk away with the general point that here am I, I'm in my mid-70s, I am still mm. stumbling across things which I wish somebody had told me 50 years ago. And there will be more. There will be lots more. And I go on finding new things, which, as you said before, are still exciting me. And why wouldn't you be excited about this yeah. stuff? So that's the general point. Just stick at it. Say your prayers. Read the text. Study it for all it's worth. Don't take no for an answer when somebody says, oh, we know what that means already. There is always going to be more. But then more specifically for me, um, this theme of vocation is so powerful, the vocation to be in ourselves individually, which is a huge moral challenge, but also in ourselves yeah. as a church, the small working models of new creation. And that's something you could kind of pin up on the mirror that you look into every morning when you get up. That's what we are called to be. What's that going to look like on the street? Because unless the people out there see these small working models, they won't yeah. believe that there could be such a thing as new creation. And particularly, a word to the wise you won't get any of this if you say, as some are doing today, we, the only way to read the Bible is by studying Plato. That's a total red herring. The idea of souls escaping upstairs to see God is the antithesis of what Paul is saying here, and it is the antithesis of the whole biblical narrative. Again, so the book is... Uh, the Yeah. yeah. The book is uh, Into the Heart of Romans, a deep dive into Paul's greatest letter. It, it has, I mean, the book is a beautiful combination of um, very in-depth uh, exegesis and biblical theology, but it's highly, highly readable. So um, it, it, whether you're a scholar or a student or a, um, a homeschool mom, whatever, I mean, if you're a Christian and, lo and love Romans, you're going to absolutely love this book. So thanks so much, Tom, for coming back on Theology in a Row. Hey, Preston, it's really good to talk to you as always. God bless you and all the work you're doing. Thank, Thank you, you very much. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.